I am not Isabel Yeo, I'm Michael Clare, and this is Isabel Yeo, and we're from the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. Um, and I think now time for something completely different, but strap yourselves in, there's a big volcano, there's videos, so if you don't like anything else, then just watch those. Um, we wanted to share some of the, the research that we've been doing over the past year and a half or so with a whole range of different collaborators, and this spans researchers who are studying natural hazards, volcanologists, um, but particularly collaborators like Tonga Cable Limited, the International Cable Protection Committee, Southern Cross, Subcom, and Google, um, and hopefully show a nice collaboration between academic research and industry, how we're learning something about hazards that face coastal communities and remote island communities, but also helping to try and make sure that the infrastructure, subsea cables, which support the global internet, uh, remain as resilient as possible going forwards. So hopefully most of you are aware, and at least based on the last presentation, subsea cables are critically important infrastructure for us all. More than 99% of all digital data traffic sent by intercontinental routes goes by subsea cables because of bandwidth limitations of satellites. So there's, there's in excess maybe 1.4, 1.5 million kilometers of subsea fiber optic cables that cross the global ocean that's currently in service, uh, and indeed many more um, that are out of service now. Um, so a network of about 400 or more than 400 of subsea cable systems provides this connectivity, and particularly to islands. Um, on this network, which is remarkably resilient, there are between something about 150 to 200 faults each year which require repair, and so most of these, about 60%, relate to accidental human activities, the interaction with fishing gear on the seabed or accidental drops of anchors. So these are relatively small instances, they can be repaired relatively quickly, um, and education can be put in place to affect um, more resilience in future. So here we show the, the telegeography map, a kind of a, a, a tube station version of the map. It's a schematic, but it gives a pretty good overview, centered on the Pacific Ocean, of where these cables lie. And, and certainly connecting us here in the UK, we have lots of cables. There's a lot of resilience because there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of backup in cable systems. The, the big circles that are shown here are earthquakes around the world, and they're just one of a number of natural hazards which happen across the global ocean, but particularly affecting places like the Ring of Fire in the <coughs> South Pacific. So we're going to talk about natural hazards, and, and whilst fishing and human activities are the primary cause of cable faults, we find that natural hazards can be quite significant. They account for maybe 10 to 20% of all cable faults since records have been kept. We show a, a plot here cumulatively showing uh, the number of, of faults that have occurred since kind of the 19, late 1950s. So whilst they account for a relatively small proportion, they can be significant. As you start to get into deep water off the continental shelf and into thousands of meters water depth, where cables are hard to reach and hard to repair, they account for, in some cases, more than a third of all cable faults. And a tropical cyclone, we here show tropical uh, typhoon tip in 1979, we show the magnitude 9 earthquake in, uh, in Japan, uh, at the top right there, they can affect large areas, which means they can synchronously damage multiple cables at the same time, unlike fishing or anchor drops. So this means in instances such as offshore Taiwan, several tens of cables were broken during one instance following a large magnitude earthquake. Similar things have happened after tropical cyclones. So this can lead to hundreds of millions of dollars of repair. It can involve multiple cable repair ships, which all need to be in the area at the same time, and then bigger knock-on uh, economic effects because of lost financial trading, for example. <coughs> So at the National Oceanography Centre and with collaborators, we've been looking at a number of instances that have caused cable damage uh, offshore. And so these include cable faults that occurred in 2020 during the first COVID-19 lockdown, when huge sediment floods pumped out loads of sand and mud from the mouth of the Congo River, which plunged in the top of the Congo Canyon and created an avalanche of sand and mud that moved at fast speed down an underwater canyon traveling more than 1,000 kilometers. And on its pathway, it not only cut loose all of our sensors that we had in the path that we were trying to measure these sorts of events, it also severed multiple cables from which we could reconstruct the speed of the flow, but that's not very much reassurance to the person who owns the cable. So we're hoping to better understand these processes and identify better crossing points within these sorts of systems. Another research that we've been doing in collaboration with the subsea cable industry is looking at um, 
evolving uh, hazards in relation to climate change. So things like coastal erosion, changes in waves and seafloor currents. But that's not the focus of this presentation. I want to stress that this network is remarkably resilient, and this is because most regions have redundancy in the network. They have backup routes in the same way as you would do with terrestrial networks. It's relatively easy to access repair ships, um, and we generally have sufficient replacement stocks of cable. That's not so much the case in places where you have few cable connections, and historically, in some places, have had none. So we'll take you on a, a brief journey to the island nation of the Kingdom of Tonga, um, and we're going to talk about a place which has one cable connecting it to the rest of the world and one cable connecting it domestically. So kind of an end member in terms of resilience. So I'll pass to Izzy to talk to you about the setting of Tonga. Thanks. Right, I'm so sorry. I'm a volcanologist, so this is probably going to be pretty different to some of the other presentations, but there are videos, as Mike said. So Tonga has a single cable connection. So as a... a uh, island nation, or in fact 130 different islands, uh, about 40 to 50 of which are populated at any one time. And actually the numbers of islands change because the volcanoes often erupt and produce an island and then the island disappears again. Uh, so you want to make sure something's been there a while before you settle on it. Um, but as a, as a nation, it's very vulnerable to not just volcanic eruptions, although obviously volcanic eruptions, but to a number of different hazards. Um, so it has one connection. It's very dependent on it because it's got people that are very disparate. Um, and it has two cables, so one that connects uh, the main island, Tongatapu, to Fiji and then on to the rest of the world, and one that connects some of the different island groups. Um, and the internet's really important uh, in Tonga for a lot of different things. I, I don't know if we've got sound working, but maybe we'll find out why uh, in a few slides' time. Now, this slide shows a picture of the seafloor. Uh, so Tongatapu is the little gold star, yellow star, and uh, it sits on a sort of plateau. And then just off to your left-hand side... Uh, you can see quite a lot of volcanoes. Um, and the one with the, the yellow box uh, was called Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha'apai. Uh, we're now calling it Hunga Volcano. Uh, thank you, Tonga, for allowing us to embarrass ourselves slightly less. Uh, but this is just one of a number of different volcanic edifices there. Um, volcanoes, they're pretty um, tempestuous and different and hard to predict. Uh, predicting volcanic eruptions is almost impossible. We've got quite good at forecasting some of them, particularly places like Iceland. Um, but in the oceans, we don't monitor volcanoes at all, really. So we've got 30 to 40 active volcanic systems sitting just off the shoreline. Um, and we don't really know what they're doing, which is a problem. Um, so the Hunger Volcano, which is the one which is highlighted by the yellow arrow, it's about 40 to 50 kilometres away from Tongatapu. And Tongatapu also has Nukualofa, which is the, the main settlement in Tonga. So it's where most of the people live. Um, and it's obviously the centre of most of their financial trading and stuff. Um, it's mostly underwater. It's almost entirely underwater. It's 1,000, 1,500 metres high, uh, depending on how recently it's erupted. Um, but only two little tiny bits of the rim stick above the surface, and they form two little islands. And they are, <laughs> just like the cable network, remarkably resilient, actually. Um, so it's quite an interesting place. Uh, it erupts quite a lot, um, but it doesn't usually erupt like it did in 2022. So normally we have a nice little eruption. Um, this is some video from the eruption um, just at the start of January, January the 14th, 2022. And this is a small volcanic eruption. This is like a friendly one you can go to in your boat and take lovely video of. Uh, this footage was collected by the Tongan Geological Services, which is their government branch of the sort of geological survey. Um, and typically, this is what we expect for volcanic eruptions in this region. So we've got 40 volcanoes, but most of the time we're having relatively small volcanic eruptions that are nice to look at. They don't really pose too much of a hazard to people or, or the seafloor. Um, this one decided to change all of that on January the 15th, though. Uh, so on January the 15th, um, and this is um, sort of an image from that video. So these are the Tonga Geological Services people that, that recorded it. We had this uh, sort of build-up um, on January the 14th where it became progressively more explosive. They went and videoed it. Luckily, they didn't go on the 15th because on the 15th, we had an absolutely enormous volcanic eruption. It was the most explosive volcanic event that we have ever recorded using modern technology. Um, and while bad for Tonga, um, and obviously all volcanic eruptions are often a tragedy and there was a loss of life. Scientifically, this is really very interesting to us because these very, very explosive events don't happen very often, fortunately. Uh, the last 
eruption that was this explosive was the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, 92. People might remember that. Um, but we have now much better observation systems than we had in the past. So down the left hand of the slide are some satellite images. Uh, these are taken before the really big eruption. Uh, you can see there's a bit of a change uh, on January the 15th. This is right before the big explosion. And the eruption had built this island that actually slid away and disappeared. And then the whole thing blew itself apart anyway. Uh, so we've got this really good record that's preserved, whereas if you'd just gone there afterwards, you wouldn't know any of this. Um, and we also have really good information from underneath the ocean. So we can't see underneath the sea from satellites. It's, it's under too much water. Uh, so here we have maps from before the eruption um, and from afterwards. Uh, so when it did this huge explosion, there it is, um, <laughs> that we could see from space, this was imaged by multiple satellites and they were only launched in 2014, 2015. So we've never been able to record eruptions like this before. We've never really had the pre and post seafloor data that we've had before. Um, and this eruption did something else that was handy for us as well, although I'd say potentially bad for the internet. Now, the eruption itself had global impacts. It produced this shockwave that went three and a half times around the world. It produced tsunamis that traveled across oceans. Um, it dumped a huge amount of ash and water vapor into the atmosphere that America says is the reason for climate change. Nobody else thinks that. Um, yeah, <laughs> there we are, some political satire. Um, so, so it was a huge, huge global event. But in Tonga in particular, the, the impacts were really quite severe. So it caused quite a lot of tsunamis, uh, smaller and larger ones. This is footage taken from the beach um, on Tonga Tapu. Um, and this is one of the smaller tsunamis that hit the island. The largest waves that were produced had run-ups of about 18 to 20 meters. So for some of the islands, they were totally overwashed. Um, Fortunately, only three people were killed um, in Tonga because of these, mainly because we had a few different smaller tsunamis ahead of time, and there was a really good tsunami education program. But this was obviously pretty devastating to communities, huge destruction of property, influences on uh, food security and education and everything. It was a nightmare. Um, the other thing that this eruption did, though, that was very interesting um, and quite unfortunate in the middle of a crisis when you are having the biggest volcanic eruption we've ever recorded, um, is the internet went completely dark. Everything stopped. So as a global scientific community, we saw a huge volcanic eruption, and everyone was like, hey, Tonga, what's going on? And you couldn't get through. Um, and the, pretty much the last thing you need when you have people dispersed across tens of islands in the midst of a very large volcanic eruption is to not be able to contact anybody. So this is a real problem. Uh, so what had happened, we wanted to understand why this volcanic eruption had cut off the internet, because that's not normally a thing we expect to see. Uh, so this little chart here, the grey shows typical internet traffic uh, for the days of the week, and then the blue line on top is when the volcanic eruption happened. Uh, you can probably see roughly when it happened on Saturday. We basically have a complete drop to nothing. There was no internet transmission whatsoever um, after the eruption. It's actually got two phases. I think Mike will explain why that is, so I should get on with this. Um, and this hit the news. Uh, so Tonga had had a huge eruption and then nobody could get through. Uh, there were emergency beacons being issued from various islands. In the end, New Zealand had to fly planes over to figure out what had happened. Uh, so we wanted to understand what had happened. And through some of our contacts, we, we've worked with Tonga Cable uh, Limited in the past. Um, we had some information and they actually contacted Mike um, after the eruption. Um, we knew that the cable had been damaged um, in these two locations. So these two stars were sort of the, the furthest down the cable they could get without seeing damage. And they're quite far away from the volcano. So we went in with this original hypothesis that we'd had some landslides probably caused by a volcanic eruption far away. Um, turned out that wasn't quite what had happened. Um, and the other thing that turned out to be exceptional when they actually did the repair, well, there are two things. Um, one is that the lengths of cable uh, that were buried were enormous. So on the domestic cable, we had 105 kilometers of burial, a lot of it under 20 meters of material. Um, and on the international cable, 89 kilometers. So all of a sudden, you need 90 kilometers of cable to repair that connection. So that, that took five weeks. Uh, three companies had to provide cable that was spliced together. They had to get a ship in from Papua New Guinea. It took ages. Um, but the domestic cable took 18 months to repair. And so if you imagine being without the internet for 18 months, it's quite substantial. Um, don't think this sound is going to work. Samisi is one of our uh, collaborators. He's the CEO of, the of Tonga Cable Limited. Um, and he is talking about how important the internet is for Tonga. Of its, GDP it's very important is from for all kinds of things. Abroad. Um, 
So what caused this damage? What was the answer here? Um, well, we had these two different seafloor surveys, one before the eruption and one that we went and collected afterwards. And we are looking at those draped over the shape of the volcano, uh, which Mike exaggerated because, you know, he's a flirt. But really, this is, it's, it looks a bit steeper than it is, but it's still very, very steep. Um, so the regions on this that are blue are where we see material that's been lost before and after the eruption. So we see the seafloor's got deeper. And regions where it's red, it's got shallower, so we've had things deposited. Um, the biggest change is that the volcano blew a eight to 900 meter hole in the middle of itself, uh, which is very substantial and important for science. It gives us an eruption volume of over six cubic kilometers, which is meaningless. Uh, doesn't really matter for the cable. What's interesting for the cables is these gullies you see down the side. So you see these blue lines down the side. And in this diagram, we're sort of looking from the northeast. And this green line is the domestic cable. And we see up to 100 meters of erosion in these, these gullies, that some of which existed beforehand, some of which didn't. Um, and then these big red patches at the bottom on top of where the cable is, which is where we're getting material deposited. So what happens in a volcanic eruption is we throw a lot of rock up into the air, and most of it will eventually come down again. Now, what happened here, we think, is that we had a huge amount of volcanic material thrown up. It stays buoyant for a bit, and then all of a sudden it's not buoyant anymore, and it starts falling back into the ocean. So we've got basically direct vertical entry of huge volumes of material that are then channeled down the sea floor um, in these little gullies and then deposited on top of the cable, which is bad for it. Um, there are some pathways. And we'll now hand back to Mike. Thanks, Izzy. So yeah, this, this huge eruption happened, and so there's some, some video, this obviously isn't video footage taken by anybody that didn't make it, but this is of simulated of these, uh, these flows of volcanic material which kind of create avalanches. The spacing between repeaters is actually much further in real life. This is an artist's <laughs> rendering, but the, the, the poor cable didn't stand a chance. At least they've tried. So. We, we've learned an awful lot about what happened here. Actually, the seafloor afterwards smoothed itself out very nicely, and we were able to provide multi-beams of seafloor data to the cable owners to reroute the cables, and it's smoothed out a lot of the seafloor. This is a one in a thousand year sort of event here, so maybe this is the best volcano to route next to, but it's not the only one. We've also learned things about the pathways, the timings of these flows, so we can reconstruct the speeds and get some handle that... Maybe they reach speeds of up to 122 kilometers per hour, so in excess of 70 miles an hour. And, and this compared to other flows anywhere else in the world, which are often reconstructed from sequential cable breaks, makes them world record holders. So Izzy has explained why these went so fast. Huge volume of dense material up straight down into the sea, hits very steep slopes. It's the Goldilocks spot for these flows being as fast as they possibly could. So the domestic cable, sadly, whilst it was laid in a valley on relatively smooth seafloor, was in not a great location, but you wouldn't design 100, 150 kilometer standoff distances from these sorts of islands. Would you design for a one in a thousand year type event? Probably not, but there's lessons learned here for what you could do to increase resilience. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned that actually here we had a pretty good view of what the seafloor looked like before, but in many places across the South Pacific, we don't have this information. We benefit from this locally in the Northeast Atlantic for having pretty good resolution seafloor. But getting repeat seafloor surveys helps us see how the seafloor is changing and helps us understand the hazards. If we haven't mapped the seafloor in detail, we don't even know what the hazards are to start with. As the previous presentation alluded to, we can use things like distributed acoustic sensing, we can use state of polarization, we can start to look at interferometry on seafloor cables and use the optical fibers as sensors to detect earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activity, um, and use things like the high loss loopback function between repeaters to localize uh, sensing between repeaters across the entirety of the ocean. This is really exciting in terms of hazards monitoring because we have a real blind spot here. Clearly, in terms of future resilience, like always, we need more diverse routes and landing stations. This exposes Tonga's um, vulnerability here, having longer and more stocks of cable. Um, and certainly here, increased investment in low-level satellite technology, particularly for small island states, um, is, is needed. So I think that reaches us at our time. Hopefully this has been a nice little distraction from, from the norm, but hopefully you can also see this, this links into the, uh, the, the opening address that 
the research we're doing with the subsea cable industry is hopefully helping to collectively build a better and more resilient internet. We're thinking about underneath the sea, but we really appreciate the invite here. Um, I'm really happy to chat to people uh, this afternoon and this evening. Thank you. So, a couple of things. Um, the orange bit on the timer, uh -huh. there's, there's five minutes oh, of that, grand. and then another five minutes. So basically you've got ten minutes for questions. Perfect. I'm sure there will be people who have some. Um, well, in but, which case, but briefly, we'll, we'll, we'll jump onto this video. This, okay. is, this is video footage that, as Izzy said, was, was shared with us. One of the remarkable things about this event is the amazing footage that came back after the internet was reconnected. People are running from tsunamis but still filming it, which is remarkable. <laughs> This video footage is taken by um, a, a fisherman who, who rents out his vessel. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you can make this out. So it's a bit shaky. There's just been a massive bang. In a minute, volcanic rocks are going to stop falling. Can you see the white water the whole way across the horizon? This is the tsunami wave that is coming. So he's there and says, basically, put your life jackets on, boys. <laughs> And as tsunami tend to travel from shallow water where they create a big wave, as they reach deeper water, they flatten out. So they only get bigger as they get closer to the coast. So in this instance here, actually, by the time the wave reached him, he didn't realise it had gone underneath him. But some of this footage is absolutely remarkable. And so we're, we're able to piece together things like the timing of the cable breaks, the satellite footage, these eyewitness observations to really start to build together a better picture here. Um, well, and information from cable operators as well has been really important because things like the timings of specific outages, um, the data that they collected, collecting, like recovering that cable, we'd have no idea the extent of burial, for example, on the seafloor with that, that information. I think this has been a really interesting example of, of the use of modern technology. I mean, you know, once it was repaired, this went through a subsea cable to reach us here today. So. The availability of things like mobile phones has actually also uh, really, really changed our, our understanding of these kind of things. And it's another reason that this eruption is so well observed compared to those in the past. For sure. And, and certainly the growth of these networks and a, and a push to better connect small island states in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, is going to mean that these sorts of hazards are going to be faced in other places. Not necessarily big eruptions like this, but smaller ones that can still pose a problem underwater landslides, underwater earthquakes, um, the sorts of things that don't necessarily affect the bit of the world that we currently live in. Uh, this was an absolutely wonderful diversion, but it's not really a diversion. <laughs> I think it was absolutely fantastic, and, and thank you for, for giving the presentation, both of you. The, when we have put in some cables, I, I work for BT, um, when we've put in some cables, we've buried them, and that's in response to the fact that obviously they're, they're in, a lot of them are in sort of busy shipping areas or fishing areas mm -hmm. more than anything. Um, has there been any analysis of the recovered wreckage of the cable and is there, a, uh, is there any form of plan on not just thinking, I mean because you could, you could say right, I don't know if it's buried already but it could be buried around the, the volcano, would that have helped? Or is there something else that we can learn from the damage that was particularly done to that cable to harden it or to, to make it so that it's more resilient to the silt coming down underwater at 120 kilometres an hour? It, it's a really good question. It's something we've been thinking about with con in the context of um, looking at hazards offshore southwest Taiwan and in the Congo Canyon offshore West Africa in places where you get flows that reach speeds of kind of 5 to 10 metres per second, so not quite as fast as this, but they're still fast enough to have broken sequential cables mm. there. Um, in terms of burial there, one, it's going to be challenging because of the terrain, the topography, the material that you've got. So actually, you know, digging into volcanic material will be a challenge. But even in canyons, the topography is pretty severe. Uh, in the case of the Congo Canyon, we've seen evidence that these flows came through and they eroded significant amounts of material. They maybe eroded up to three cubic kilometers of material as they made their passage down the canyon. So if you buried a cable one or two meters, the <laughs> flow don't care. It's, it's going to erode that bit of seafloor as well. We've seen evidence offshore Taiwan where maybe 10, 12 cables have broken sequentially, but some actually between them have survived, and it's, it's unclear exactly as to why they survived. Was it because successive flows put cumulative strain on the cables, dragged them down, and then eventually they broke? Is it because some of those were buried, or is it just because flows were slowing down and sloshing round bends, and they, they, they were slightly slower or more benign at that point? 
Here, I think recovery is going to be pretty much impossible to, to get the cables back. Um, in, in terms of designing, there's been work that's been done also looking at, you know, can you beef up the armour on the cables? There's obviously a limit of what you can do in deep water. But in so doing, you increase the diameter of your cable, you increase the cross-sectional cross area to the flow, so you increase the, the drag force and the cost. Yeah. So, the, I, I, As you've been saying that, I've just been thinking about the, the way that buildings are constructed in places of high earthquake activity, like Japan, mm -hmm. New Zealand, California. Um, perhaps the answer, and, and it, it, it strikes me that, again, my employer had to do a lot of research into how we can run fiber overhead on cables, mm -hmm. and in relation to the amount of slack mm -hmm. and, and give that they have in the wind and, and various forces. I wonder if perhaps the answer is, and I'm, I'm completely spitballing, not to make it harder, but to make it flex. Yeah, so I think there's a, there's a lot in that. So we've also given thought to the amount of slack that you actually lay into the cable. So when you are laying across canyons, as an example, if you know you've got recurrent flows coming down, then leave enough slack in there just so that you don't end up snagging on a bit of rock and, and uh, leading to abrasion that might lead to a shunt fault later on. One of the things that happened uh, in this particular case, though, is that that, that uh, international cable was actually pushed five kilometres north. So it's a hell of a lot of slack you need um, to account for that. Actually, there, there was yeah. something we, we did, didn't dig on here, but um, it was one of the really amazing observations is, is that the volcano's here, right? The cable's here. <laughs> the flows came this way, apparently, and the cable was found five kilometers that way. So it went towards the volcano. So we thought, well, this is really odd. And then started looking at the relief of the seafloor. And basically, there's loads of other submarine volcanoes all over the seafloor, these seamounts. And it's like a crazy marble track, right? You roll them. So one of our colleagues, Emily Lane, in, in New Zealand, um, did some numerical modeling of the flows and found actually the most likely flow path was that it came round, it got steered around the volcano, and then came back up to the north. So it came back on itself. Yes, so, you can't run away. No, yeah. <laughs> so all, all these kind of observations come together, and they, 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 they kind of explain some of the peculiar things that, that, that we saw. It's, it's, it's such a fascinating subject. Thank you for indulging me. I oh, thank you. It. Thanks for the invite. Hi, it's uh, Will from Lonap. Um, can, I, can I understand, like, um, like, the kind of affected area? Because obviously you say the cable was dragged, like, five kilometres. If we want to have an island nation, the island's not that big. We want to run some cables into it in a diverse fashion. And it seems like, from our previous discussion, we should probably just run more cables rather than trying to protect existing ones. Because, um, you know, a subsea cable is as thick as your thumb in the deep sea ocean. Yep. So you know, we can, we can run more. Um, is, is, it, is it, like, how big a, how big a di di diversity do we need? You know, do we need to, like, keep these cables 20 kilometres apart or, or more or less? Or? Well, I think that's a very hard... Sorry, I think that's a very hard question to mm. answer. Um, we don't quite know how far the flows here went because everywhere we've sampled, we've found them. Mm. So we know that they've gone at least 80 kilometres to the south and about 150 out to the the west, they're going downhill there, so you'd expect them to go a bit further. They are obviously thinning out a lot by the time you get 80, 90 kilometres away, so they are probably less of a risk uh, to cables there. That said, we know they spin around and all kinds of random things can happen. Um, so in terms of a standoff zone, you're probably thinking, I mean, about 100 kilometres, <laughs> but these volcanoes are 20 kilometres apart. So if you start putting 100 kilometre standoff zones around all of them, I mean, they're, they're a barrier. So I think it's very hard to plan for those, and I think you're right, you want to be putting multiple cable routes in. Um, for some island nations, it's quite hard to make that business case, I think, to put in multiple routes, um, and that is definitely the case here. Uh, you can also do things like uh, have more availability of repair cable, um, more repair ships, better low-level satellite coverage, for example, uh, in case it does happen. Um, the problem here is you could potentially lay a cable the other side, but then you're going off the continental slope. So you're going across a whole bunch of canyons, which, as Mike has mentioned, are not great, um, and a whole lot of other stuff as well. So there are risks everywhere. Um, you potentially could lay two uh, through the volcanics and hope that two volcanoes in the same place didn't go off within a year of each other. Um, but again, making the business case to actually do that can be quite difficult for, for very small nations with small GDPs. But it, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's certainly a trade-off, right? Because like, everyone's now learned about this volcano, so that's fresh in people's minds. But there's a whole range of other things that could constitute a threat to subsea cables. So as Izzy says, you, 
you want to trade off, but maybe thinking about a diversity of, of landing stations and thinking of something. Maybe, maybe if something did come out the eastern side of the island and then went up to the north, then maybe that would be more resilient. The Caribbean islands have thought about this. They kind of root down wind of the tropical storms that come okay. through to make sure they minimise the impacts that come through there. Um, but you have to factor this in with fishing and everything else, right? Yeah, because we could tend to think like the biggest risk from a European point of view is like, oh, we have all these nice cables and they land in this big sandy bay and some large ship comes along in a storm, chucks an anchor down and it's like, oh, we laid these all, these all parallel. That, yeah. that didn't work so well. Um, and, and another question, if I may, is like, were any repeaters affected? Because, I mean, obviously, we, we typically see a cable fault and hopefully not repeater faults, but then what about stockage of repeaters and stuff? So I think the video was a bit misleading. <laughs> yeah, because they, like, they should be like 100 kilometres apart, right? Yeah, take, so, yeah. so I, I don't think so. So I think just to the north in, yeah. in this particular case. Um, we, we didn't, at least, we, we haven't spent much time looking at exactly what the nature of the cable was, but mm. um, to my understanding, no repeaters were, were harmed. Great, thank you very much. Great presentation. I think Will's last point sort of half answers my question, but um, when these cables are failing because of environmental factors like volcanoes, what what's causing them to fail? Are they getting stretched because they're getting pulled and snapping, or are they great, great abrading, question. So or are they squashed, or... Is it pulling out the repeater or, or, or In, in this instance, we don't have a solid answer, but in yeah. other places where these density currents, these flows of sediment have impacted, it, it mostly is a shunt fault that starts. So it's abrasion of the outer casing, it's ingress of water leading to a short that then leads to a shunt fault. So it's typically that. In this case, though, it was so fast, potentially hot at that point, but we don't know for sure. Izzy thinks it's cooled down, so yeah. I trust the volcanologist, yeah, right? That uh, brings so much well, talk yeah. sense. Um, but the other thing is the domestic cable had 22 metres of material just dumped on top of it. So that's probably going to be a big part of it. You know, you probably only need to put a couple of metres of sediment on top of, of dense material suddenly on top of a cable to, to cause that, yeah, that kind of differential problem. So um, frustratingly, we generally don't know. We recover the ends that we can recover. I say we, the cable repair companies yeah. recover the ends, but they're recovering the intact bits. Yes. not the bits that got damaged. Uh, certainly you know, in the Congo Canyon, they, they brought back the cable. They saw it had kind of <laughs> melted effectively as a result of a shunt fault. And so they said it must be an underwater volcano. At least there I know there aren't underwater volcanoes. It must be something else. This one, we're pretty sure it was an underwater volcano as well for various other reasons. Are, are, are there opportunities where it's not necessarily that deep, where you've got more opportunity to sort of try and dig it out and recover it and things, so. yeah, yes but but generally there's very little no opportunity money to, no, nobody yeah. cares about that they're basically they're trying to repair the cable yeah. as quickly it's as cheaper possible to just put another one across the top of it and yeah but it, it's certainly pretend. where making mono, uh, doing measurements of say distributed acoustic sensing on cables you'd get the stuff in the build up to the breaks so you get some handle of like is it a sudden strain or is it a cumulative build up yeah Sorry, I'm conscious of time now no, okay. no, that's great take, take one more question you have one more question thanks uh, thank you for a very entertaining coverage of this. I've read lots about this uh, in the press uh, previously, and, but this was a much nicer uh, treatment <laughs> of it. Uh, I think you were definitely right about uh, the issues of cost for diversity, and realistically it's impossible to guard against yep. failure here, and survivability is probably not the fix. It's about mean time to repair. Uh, I was just wondering if you thought there were any other things other than simply volcanoes that also run into the same space. I mean, the landslides in general, I would assume, but is there anything else? Yes. I mean, there's a whole host of different things. So, I mean, the sorts of hazards we've been looking at are tropical cyclones, extra tropical storms that affect the northeast Atlantic. Um, Large sediment transport events that might be triggered by earthquakes, might be triggered by landslides, can be triggered by oceanographic processes. So these turbidity currents that we get, these kind of avalanches of sand and mud can affect the submarine canyons that lie far off the coast of the UK, as well as other places like you know, offshore Congo Canyon. Um, and then there's kind of surprise things that happen in the deep sea that we don't know about, and we're starting to learn. We've learned a huge amount about how processes work in the ocean, about natural hazards by virtue of the first telegraph cables that were laid in the late 1800s and early 1900s. 1929, large earthquake triggered a submarine landslide, triggered a tsunami, but it sequentially broke the cables that connect North America to the UK, albeit telegraph cables. So 
there are a host of different processes, particularly in the deep sea, and they can be far larger. You know, the landslides that happen on the sea floor can involve areas the size of Scotland, for example. So, and they can happen on less than two degrees slope. That's the drainage angle of a Premier League football pitch for context. So uh, they, they take us by surprise fairly consistently. Cool, thank you very much. Okay, right. so that was the last question. Oh, oh. One thing. <laughs> to briefly put my PC hat on, <laughs> the here is a real world thing that will screw with your network <laughs> are some of the most popular, most engaging and most rewarding topics for a lot of our attendees. If there is anybody in this room or anybody who is attending remotely who has a similar here is a real world thing that will screw with your network sort of talk, we absolutely would like you to submit that as a talk because this is exactly why UKNOF exists as a thing. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very Thank much. You.